Okay, good morning. Um, welcome to this second day where we're looking at photon programming and future trends and how we can develop software. So this is sort of my setup for these parts one, two, and three. So this morning we'll look at the mathematics of arrays and other stuff related to code transformations <laughs> and optimization. So we have this very ambitious plan and I would like you to uh, know how to add properties to the requirement declarations for the templates uh, and come up with a systematic approach to try to find your IDSL. You remember that an IDSL is just another name for the template requirements and show how to use rules to make code more efficient. Uh, which is sort of using them as transformations on software code, and then have some say about the mathematics of arrays. So basically, I want you to want rewrite tools for your software, and sort of don't know who will supply them, but at least you can start shouting. So much of this is based or ideas based from a sequence of papers. The first one is about domain engineering, figuring out what your API should be. And since I'm sort of touting that you should make these internal DSLs, you should make the requirements fit your problem domain, then some ideas from here could be useful. And this isn't written with numerical applications in mind at all. So it's sort of from a business domain, but show some examples of that. And then there's a sequence of papers we did, which was first starting with investigating what is the array API I need to implement finite difference methods. Now we looked at sort of a software stack where we had these coordinate field numerics, which is where you write your business logic for solving PDEs. But this is sort of looking at the lower level where in the machine and sort of say, what do I need from the array? And it's also an interesting observation that with using fine grain type thing in the IDSL, I can uh, reduce the need for testing. And in this case, for this API, you can actually reduce the number of tests you need to two tests, two plus, D is the number of dimensions, W is the width of the stencil. So if you have, and just choose your numbers, use three for the D, use maybe five for W, and you are sort of down to a few handfuls of tests. And if it's a multidimensional, you may actually, no, that's what you need, basically. Then you can completely test that your error implementation is correct. So you can trust it. And then you just have to worry about your high levels. So what does it mean trusting the area implementation? It means that if you are compiling towards a transformation tool like OOPS or something which tries like an OpenMP, which tries to mess up your code and distribute it in strange ways, you know that those transformation systems which parallelize your code really messes up the whole array traversal, they mess up how things are made out in memory, and you don't know how many special cases they have. Running this number of tests, we can make certain that for the data sizes you're working with, at least they haven't messed up your infrastructure, their array implementation, the distribution of the data will actually be according to what you expect. So you can actually have this as preprocessor run as part of your build, where you're running these tests to check that the error implementation is actually working. There's some limitations on why how this works and why this works, but I won't go into the details. So this is an interesting observation. And then we have these three papers looking at the mathematics of arrays for finite difference methods. Uh, taking this API to the arrays and looking at DNF transformations, so I'll explain what that is. And then we are looking at other transformations. This is sort of how we systematically 
introduce cladding, which is sometimes what you have these duplicated cells around the edge of your partitions, so that you don't have to communicate for every time step, but you sort of recompute the border areas multiple times and save all the communication. Of course, with the modern architecture, this is very much needed because new computers is cheap, communicating is expensive. And the final one is trying to you know, systematically set together these ideas, build a new work system, and apply that automatically on code. And the PC problem is a priest Michael Wolf, who wrote the paper about the P3 problem. And it is sort of portability, productivity, and performance. So performance, portability, productivity. Yeah, I think that's the three. So it's sort of it's a bouquet of papers going in this direction. Uh, a little warm up, which is um, sort of declaring data structures. And I can't think of anything more advanced than. So a person, name, age, address, identity number, profile image, and maybe more data. Uh, there was an example yesterday that you mentioned from biosciences where they have a similar problem. Um, well, I'm Facebook, so I have about 5 billion of these records. Um, so this is modern Fortran, pre-1990, Fortran 77. We can create this as a derived data type. So we'd have to instead have an array for each of the fields. So five billion names, five billion ages, five billion addresses. So together we get the person in number P, this name number P, age number P, address number P, etc. And we can see intuitively that this data structure, this data structure will contain the same information. So we can sort of map between these two. And now comes the question to the audience, where I want active participation and vocal opinions. Which of the two styles gives better code? And the isomorphism between the two formats, can you describe what you want to do? But recall that inside this array of structure inside the structure inside the person it actually might be an array in itself like children or ex-spouses or something like that so we have to deal with nested arrays indirectly through uh, the right type but first question which of the two styles seems better what is better what is better, what is better? Uh -huh. Okay, which alternatives do you have for better? So a uh, faster runner. Yeah. Better readable for you. Yes. Those are three important. Dimensions. These are two important. Naively to me, the two important. And uh, I would directly say uh, the one AOS is better readable. Yeah. And uh, the second one is for for the use cases I can easily think of dramatically better perform factors yep. of time. I agree. Yes. It depends on the access pattern and how efficient that code will be. Yeah. Because if you are, if you, you have to load up all cache line, that's the smallest part you can get from the memory. And if you have several objects in the cache line, you have already loaded them and you need the next one, so that's better efficiency. Mm -hmm. If you have to load cache line for every one of them, you might just waiting, wasting a significant amount of memory bandwidth. So yeah. it totally depends on the access pattern. Yes. And if that's not known, then my reader is what we see on the round is millions of many different times. The access pattern is important. Mm -hmm. And especially if you're just using one field, like I'm trying to figure out the average age. So just looking at the age fields, then if I'm loading cache times with all the other things, images and stuff, it could cost me sort of one. Cash miss per person, and that will be expensive. There was a comment out of the for, um, Zoom. Isn't SOA more efficient memory wise? No, they're, they're exactly the same. Yeah. 
depending on the overhead the compiler has for it. Yeah, perhaps he's not explaining. I read that uh, that he was with respect to uh, memory performance, which was oh, yeah. what was it? Yes. So I think we have an understanding that one is better from a software engineering perspective, the other may be much better from a efficiency perspective. But then we have this question down here. Isomorphism means that you can automatically translate from one representation to the other and back again. Yeah. But the underlying problem is how is that organized in memory? So what I start hearing from you is that um, the transformation is something virtual or whatever. But uh, if um, if I put it in memory, at some point I have the, so what I am uh, also what was said back there. So if I take a structure of arrays, I put all the second names, mm -hmm. then I put all the first names, I put all the addresses, and I put all the Whereas if I do the other one, I have first name, second name, address, next, okay, next, perhaps a few more mm -hmm. qualifiers, and uh, making one into the other one that is like a matrix transpose, which is a very evil operation. Yes. But you said also to have, have children that could have a race. Yes. Right? And, and you also have to have extra tables for children. Well, you get two dimensional arrays. So the array people, and then I have the extra dimension is sort of children. So instead of just translating this into a 1D array, I get the 2D array for the case of children, I get the 1D array for the case of the name, and I get the 1D array for the case of the age. So it's sort of, I can do this transformation. But I can do it at source code level, so I don't have to transpose the data in memory. So it's transposed when we read it in. And this is <clears throat> important because I don't need to decide when I'm writing my code, do I want it this way or that way? I can write my code for readability, and then the system can transform that readable code into the efficient form. You don't want to do transposes at your time unless you really have to. It sometimes can actually be worthwhile, but if you can do it at compiled time, you choose the layout that's efficient for the problem of the soul. Then we're playing in a different setting. You don't force our users, developers, to write a specific style of code which hampers maintainability. They can write maintainable code. And then we can transform that maintainable code into the efficient code. So what you what I'm hearing is that I write code AOS, and the compiler uh, put makes a memory layout with this SOM. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or you have an intermediate step where you take your source code and you automatically rewrite it in from the AUS form to the SLA form, and then the compiler compiles the SLA form. Remember that a program is not a static object, it's a mathematical object. If I have isomorphisms, I can change my program without changing the semantics. So we are stuck in having program doing a lot of generic tasks when, when we have compiled it. Mm -hmm. you know, we think about that uh, you can run compile multiple times. Yeah, or sort of write, edit, write my code, and the better, nicer I write it, the better tools I can have to make it into something that's efficient, targeted, Yeah, okay, why not? My perhaps most successful optimization code uh, project was taking an AOS code, newly written, and telling the people bad idea, and then we transformed it in this way. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what you tell me, what you tell now is that at least in some cases, uh, because it's a pretty mechanic process, I can outsource that to co computer. So in principle, a uh, lot of that seems that it never crossed my mind, but it seems a pretty obvious idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Since exactly, <clears throat> I want the bonus. 
Mm, I'm not sure whether you get a bonus for an obvious idea. <laughs> <laughs> the people have been doing these transformations, have been measuring the results, and they've been claiming more or less efficiency from the transformation based on what kind of data they have come up with to do the test. So it's very interesting that you have real actual performance data because you have a real problem you want to solve and you demonstrated that this is an efficiency transformation. You have some more on, uh, I like this thing about the children. So what I took is that uh, if you have an area of structure, so um, in, in, in line with what Jonas said yesterday, that uh, so you have a base entry, which is a person. Then if the person is a child, you get some extra entries, which, uh, for, so for instance, which school does it go to or whatever. Mm -hmm. If the person, let's say, is an adult, you might put an employer, an employer is not a school. So essentially, you uh, the entries are not all the same, sort of they are sort of person at the basic, but then they have extensions to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, to get that in a structure of arrays, so structures of array are very nice if every entry is the same kind, because mm -hmm. then I can just, okay, I have a million entries, all the arrays are a million long. Mm -hmm. But uh, then uh, if you have, to, if you start with this, then you can be very full that everyone gets uh, in the memory layout, everyone gets the entry school, everyone gets the entry employer. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the children, it is just, uh, the employer is just focus. And with, uh, with the adults, the school is just uh, mm -hmm. uninitialized mm -hmm. focus number. But that, that becomes very wasteful with memory. If you are strapped on, if I'm not strapped on, and it also disturbs my students. Mm -hmm. uh, so one way of thinking is maybe we can have sparse arrays for that kind of data. But then you're into more special cases where simple transformation is not enough and you need to maybe adapt the transformation tool, look for what am I looking at now? Am I interested in people who are employed? Maybe I'm filtering away that other information. Yeah. Well, in many cases, you have very regular things. Otherwise, we need indirection. And then if you have an array of indirect person pointers, you really are adding costs to your access pattern. You get into stuff like this. Yeah. Yes. So if you want to sort of have a pointer to school children and another pointer to a subclass which is employed people, you are sort of having to follow this indirect link to make the memory efficient. So you pay him in some way. So it isn't really that I have this array of very compact person records. I have a pointer to school children and different pointer type to employed people. And yeah, you may do some sort of magic if you know what you're looking for, but there's, uh, yeah, you can do some sort of magic when you know what you're doing, what you're aiming for. And the thought of doing this kind of transformations, I think, can really help having both maintainable software and achieving the efficiency you have for those applications, which can really boost from a new organization. Uh, <clears throat> now, this isomorphism is basically building on knowledge of uh, that the data layout doesn't change the amount of data we work with. Uh, but in the examples yesterday, I had two requirement operations at the maximum, which was a type and a function. And some, some cases are called this semi-group, which is a type and the same function declaration. So what's the difference between the two requirements? The name? The name, yes. But also, if you are sort of pure mathematician, it obviously gives you different associations. Because this one is just associated with declaration, that's sort of the magma, while a semi-group, in addition to having the declaration, also has an associativity property. So I could have explained that associativity property with declaration like this, small subroutine, taking x, y, and z, 
And then I have the next plus, and then I have the right plus, and then these should be yield the same value even though the expressions are different. I just expect my school that this doesn't hold. It doesn't hold. In numerics. Doesn't hold for certain points. No. <laughs> Uh, so that's a big problem with our numerical representation. But at least sort of, this is the idea we associative that you have this rule, this equation describing an extra property. And normally we write our codes based on this, and we say, ah, oh, here I prefer this form because that is more accurate. And this other place I prefer that form because that gives me better accuracy. So we're using these associative laws when we're writing code, being very conscious about the round of errors and other properties or our, our implementation devices. Or praying. Hmm? Praying does it, that it doesn't burn you. <laughs> that is one thing I often see people do not think about it. They just use it and hope that they don't get burned that 16 digits in a double is not is enough. Mm -hmm. What's this problem to be ignored? Yes, um, sometimes well, you can analyze the problem about stability and stuff and say, well, I don't have to worry. Or you say, this is very sensitive. Let me rephrase the whole thing. But, anyways, um, if you can start thinking about not just the variations, but also the properties, we have a larger vocabulary of tools. That, um, yes? Uh, a couple of questions in the Q and A document. I want you all to read them since it is closer to the microphone. Uh, I think you could also invent automatic re-indexing arrays during the transformation to map information, which is not present for all. And please, as Marne explained. Okay, so it is the compiler like so is is the compiler like modern G four transversions during the transformation A or S to S or A, and the code is almost same speed. I did not understand if this, if it is a real problem. Uh, as far as I know, it's a real problem and the compilers do not do it because the compilers follow verbatim what you have said. They do lots of low level optimization, but they don't do the AOS as an A optimization because they assume that you as the writer know better what you want than the compiler does. That's the current compiler technology. There might be some options in some experimental compiler which allows you to do that, but I'm not aware of that. So it's, it's a proposal perhaps for Fortran 2000, whatever. 2021, to associate those tools, or they could be third party tools, just need a compiler front end, you do the transformations, you spit out another Fortran program, which you then feed to your regular compiler. So, one thing should everything go inside this one monolithic tool called the compiler? Or should we have a battery of tools which we can mix and match in the build process? And I think we've been putting too much emphasis on the compiler and wanting to do everything. And I see that in the C++ world, they are really wanting the compiler to do everything. But sort of there are lots of external tools which can do this. I don't know that they are exist for Fortran, but it shouldn't be too difficult. Once you have a good infrastructure to build up for it. Uh, so this is this is a thing you can read the right in Fortran code, except that. Photon does not have a set of statements, but you can fake it if you want to need it. And the other thing it doesn't have is that we cannot put these properties together with the requirements. That's not being thought of as part of the current required proposal for requirements. Also, think it's a bit too early to bring this into the discussion because just getting the Syntactic part of generics right is uh, a hard enough task at the moment. But if you can start playing with these semantic properties, you're sort of getting into an interesting world. So, one thing is you can implement your own assertion 
using if then else is then a stop statement. Uh, when you're thinking about the actual content of the properties you want to write, uh, you can write simple equations as the differences of unity. You can write conditions with equations. So if some condition uh, equation holds, then the following should hold. Um, I think the photon is getting choice expressions of an if and else expression in 2023 release. And the next level is for the right arbitrary logical expressions as part of your set statement to tell the properties you expect want to hold. And also note that if you look into the verification literature, you see quantifiers lives everywhere. But if you are writing these kind of assertions on the requirement, you very rarely feel the need for a quantifier. And if you do, you can actually get rid of it by changing your API. So you can make do with very simple expressions in the assertions and still talk about most interesting properties for the code you're writing. And the good thing, of course, is that. As programmers, logical expressions, equations, that's what we do all day. That's what we know. Quantifier sort of takes us into an easy ground. So the good news is you don't need to go there. You can write these properties without worrying about quantifiers. Now the neat trick is that if you look at this subroutine with the assertion inside. The variables here are sort of just what we would have in a normal procedure argument. For every x, y, and z, this property should hold. So there's an implicit quantifier there for those who want to do formal logic. But for a software developer, this is just like a procedure declaring the variables. And then it says that if I want to use this for a test, I have to check it for every x, y, and z. I have to be some clever way of reducing the number of tests. So, properties can be used for testing. The test oracles you can use them as part of your unit tests, and they behave just as just as a normal code would behave for the unit tests. Uh, there's a very famous tool from Sweden called Quick Check. And it started out as being tool for Haskell, then it was commercialized for Ayla with Ericsson paying, I guess. And there's also a version for Java. We did some work with a Netflix plugin for running tests of Java. And we also created a library with support for running these kind of property based tests on C. Now that has, is a bit stale because we haven't touched it for a decade. So this changes the theme because now we're going to look at how can we create good IDSLs or look at what are the requirements we should be creating. We're sort of trying to figure out what is the domain specific language for the problems we want to solve inside a template. And all this is because we have type set templates. So we need to have requirements clause and that allows us to juggle with the language of the expressions we use inside the template. So this process of domain engineering is sort of geared towards finding types procedures and properties associated with those operations. Uh, I don't know if you know Venus Bjornud. He has been working on this problem of domain engineering since his early days in Vienna. And he was part of the team for the Vienna Development Method, which was a formal method from the 70s, maybe even before that, uh, earlier than that. And he's still sort of writing new books and papers on this. So he has a new book out in last year. Four of the pages 
Now this guy is highly dead. He um, travels around the world giving courses in domain engineering. And he thinks that what he's been doing in this area the last five years is sort of his most important contributions to the world. And then I have this much more modest person's size of pages, but also in the approach because his is much more heavy handed than what I'm uh, present as an approach to the main engineers. And we have been giving courses for us a couple of times, and he's sort of quite intrigued by the simplicity that we're getting from this way of thinking. So I'll sort of present this as if I'm going to formalize the domain, I will have to ask some questions about the domain. Now the domain may be a mathematical problem at some point, a physical problem, a body problem. I'm asking the questions of the domain means I'm going to be talking to somebody working in that area, having knowledge of what to do something. I may be introspecting my thoughts about TDE solvers. I might be looking at something else, but I'm sort of saying what are the types? And I shouldn't just say it's an array. I should really try to figure out what are the high level types that we never make explicit, but we really use when we're thinking how to get them down as a data type with sort of what is the information hidden inside this informal description of the types of what's given. And then we want to expose what kind of primitive processing we have. And again, get away from arrays. They were just a computational device introduced centuries ago. Our computers these days have programming systems which allows us to talk about much more specific types. We do that in a much better way than reducing everything to arrays. Yes, in sort of science fields, the array is sort of a universal computational device. But you don't have to write a code at that level. So you want to expose the information being involved in the equation, sort of all, all the inputs, all the results coming out. Then you want to refactor, create new pieces of information. Look at information conversion, gigavolts, giga electron volts, mega electron volts, for instance. What you need to actually compute the algorithm, you need to add some extra information. Does it depend on something more? And um, what information is produced? But this is iterative. You, you revisit this, you think it over, you reflect upon it, and you save some time in this part of the analysis process. And so don't assume something. Don't assume that the function works for a fixed mass, make the mass explicit. Later on, you can make special instances of things for fixed masses, but make as much information available as possible and type it explicitly and differently. It's a different dimension, it's a different measuring system, maybe type of things differently. But it's flexible, we can change your mind. You just playing with declarations, but the cost of playing with declarations is low compared to the cost of writing software. And think about everything as data, don't worry about processes, all information is data. All of these things are simple, straightforward functions. You don't think about parallel processing as of yet. You don't think about concurrency, just say. These are the operations I would like to work in my domain. And you don't think about the solver as such, you think about the language you will use to express the solver. So in this um, domain engineering system, set up five steps. Uh, so the first is to find the template requirements of the IDSL. And then we have the domain questions from the previous page. Then I say step four is when you actually try to write some application in your idea cell. Uh, the second step is write those properties. 
vital properties really improves the quality of the video cell. Have to reflect more, give a different perspective. Oh. Sound. Yeah, no, uh, it is that uh, participants, if you're standing over there, it's not picking up. If I'm putting it here, then people can probably hear, better hear it okay. regardless. There's only one mark. Yeah. It's that we're standing on the side. Refine the domain concepts so you're not sort of fixing it in stone, you're playing with it, maturing it. Trying to see if can I recognize something which is a similar ring, something which is a ring, something which is a known mathematical structure. Because if you cling into this is a group, suddenly there's a vast theory of things you can do with groups that you might not have thought was relevant for your code, but which you can use when you are designing your code. Uh, and then you sort of start architecting your implementation, thinking about the generics. You can build on top of it because we may sort of move towards a multi layer system where we are implementing one layer in terms of the other rather than having everything in one big idea cell. So we can partition these into different idea cells for different purposes. We can combine them when needed. We can keep them separate and we can build implementations for one idea cell from the implementation of another idea cell. And then we want to run the applications in the end. So here's a very stupid example from uh, personnel management. And the reason it's here is that this German guy tried to come up with a set of examples that would show various development techniques, how they played out. So this is sort of one of the first overarching examples for that sort of collection of developing methods. So this domain should be familiar enough. So you sort of have an intuition of what's happening, but now we're sort of trying to figure out what is this domain about? What are the types we talk about? What are the operations that are already mentioned in this short description? Anybody? Types. What are the types of information that seem to be involved? Strings and uh, numbers. Everything is strings and numbers, but those are low level types. You've analyzed too much. I want you to be at this level of abstraction. Think that we can make derived types for everything, which object classes would be natural, which are the classes being talked about. Employee, employee for instance, and company, and company and employee probably have different information content. Address. Addresses, salary, yeah, departments. And what are some of the operations mentioned? Mm -hmm. Persistence and distributions, we'll just put that to the side. But well, this very simplistic description of a system has lots of information about the high level types, the operations we want. 
So I sort of try to highlight some of the threats, highlight some of the functions described. And then we can start reorganizing this. So employee was sort of seemingly important and employee is obviously a person. So I'm adding more information that is in the text, but that is sort of implied with some knowledge of the name. Obviously, if you're talking about people, we have names. We're talking about companies, they may have names. We have addresses. A good thing by keeping things at this level is that we are not assuming that the address is a street name, a street number, a zip code, or the Swedish format, and the name of the town. <clears throat> it's address as an abstract entity. And if you're going to the US or a different country, addresses in different formats. We're saying name is an abstract entity. In this country, we have first name, last name, and maybe some in the middle names. In Norway, we have a slightly different structure. In Spain, they have a different structure on the name. But they're saying, okay, we have identified the name type. We're not looking at the structure to that. We're just looking at how many strings we should use to represent the name. Maybe we want to distinguish between the name of a person and the name of a company. Maybe the name of a company would have a different structure later on. So maybe you have different name types. Operations, well, assuming a company has sort of CEO, should that CEO be registered in the personal database? Well, if we do, it makes something simpler probably because then all people in the company are in the same database. Was explicitly said that we should be able to sum the salaries. And further on, it sort of is also stated that he wants to cut salaries. Now, this guy from Germany, he was brought up in East Germany, so he has this very austerity feeling. So he doesn't have pay rises, it's just pay cuts. Uh, we need the getters and the setters, which are sort of a normal part of our OO thinking. So maybe if you try to concretize a person, it has at least a name, address, and a tax number. Again, a tax number wasn't mentioned in the original description. So this is extra information that comes with the domain. We're trying to make these things explicit so that we can have them in our vocabulary when you want to build applications, talk about things. Coffee is coming. Oh, coffee is coming. I think it's a bit early in my. No, you didn't come in. <laughs> okay. So the coffee is a bit shy today. Yeah. How is the risk of it being stolen? I've never heard of it being stolen. You better have a British human person. I would think it's fairly safe for students, but it's all wrapped up if it's sort of half I open. Like, I never heard of anyone standing <laughs> up behind it. Not until it has been posted. If you put it out, well, exactly, but I mean, if you put out the leftover, no one would say anything. Uh, you don't trust the students up there. Um, I trust <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe it's like experience from down south. Anyways, it depends on various things you can't always. Not always transfer knowledge from one domain to another domain. Yeah. But if you want to write these formal specifications, these sort of assertions of the properties, there are some sort of guidelines, techniques to get started. And in like this business domain, typical thing is to split up things in new types and known types. And you also see that in the way you organize the operations also for more scientific domains. So typically numbers and strings are known types and names and addresses are not known types. So you might want to say that maybe there's a component of a name which is a String, so maybe there's a function called first name which gets part of the name. 
Uh, so when we distinguish between new types and known types, the operations of servers that return the old type. So observing the first name as a string is an observer. It observes, it gives you the first name and the known type from the new type. Generators are things which return some new types. So if it's a big company, sort of hiring and firing employees would be an operation which would take a new type and return a new type, modified company. It takes a company, adds a person, you can have a device company, you have a company and you fire somebody and you have a changed company. So the hiring and firing people would generate new values for companies. You might sort of have a setup of a company where you register it with a name and you get tax authorization and stuff like that, which would be creating a new company. Now, sometimes you can take generators and split them further into constructors building new values and extensions or new ways of building old values. So if I hire somebody that creates a new value for the company, if I fire somebody, well, maybe the effect of firing somebody I hired previously can be seen as, well, if I had a different hiring policy from the start with, I wouldn't have to fire somebody. So then we sort of have hiring is constructing new data for companies. Firing somebody is just a different way of creating a value to be created without firing somebody. And then there are sort of three perspectives on this observational specifications. You take every observer and you combine it with every generator, and then the observer tells you what has been changed when I was hiring somebody. What has changed in the company when I fired it somebody? Or you can have transactional specifications, then you combine every generator with every generator. And classical mathematics, like the semi group we looked at, is combining in that example plus with itself. So then we are combining generators with generators. So this dialogue specification often reveals more mathematical properties, like being a group, like being a monoid, which is something we can exploit later. And there's a third approach called sufficiently complete, which is back into the 1970s. Um, it's a careful mix of the above, and it has some sort of uh, properties with respect to computability. But these are some tricks and guidelines for setting up uh, formal specifications. And then sort of just repeating this, that our axioms or properties can be written using programming language logic. Um, basically, if we have a Boolean data type and then a certain mechanism, we can add this kind of specifications to any programming language. Integrated to unit testing, uh, we can use pre post tools to prove properties so we actually have access to verification tools when we start writing properties. Uh, the interesting thing with doing this in the programming language itself is that we have programming language semantics. So all the weird corner cases of the language are accessible in the specification. We are not off into some math specification system, which has a different semantics and then we need to map back and forth. Also pragmatic thing, you can start out with zero axioms, you write one or two, and then next week you write five more. You can just add these properties one at a time or in bunches. It doesn't destroy anything of your previous work, it just adds more insights to the previous work. And this is as opposed to many other of these more formal specification techniques. You have to specify quite a lot to get started. Okay, so just gently figure out types and functions, and then you throw in more insights as you develop. So it's a sort of very nice property of this kind of specification system. Uh, let me just. Talk about a couple of tools that can be useful. 
can actually get the verification tools on this. So we take the required API with properties and we take the target API for our generic code. So this is the requirement statement with properties associated. This is somebody else's required statement. So we have an IDSL and an IDSL. Now the generic code maps from this, these requirements to somebody else's requirements. And then the formal proving step is saying, if I know these requirements, I know my generic code, will I be able to prove that these requirements hold? And that actually works. There are many automated tools, so we can compile from this setup to the setup of like the SMT solver. And the SMT solver can chunk away on it and after a few seconds say, yes, it holds, or no, does not hold, here's why. Or it will say, uh, I'll keep on charging on this. And if you ever will get the result out of such an automated solver, typically you get it within the first fractions of a second, or it will sort of go on for millennia before it will actually turn an answer. So very often these are stopped after a few seconds if they don't deliver any answer. And these are much more powerful solvers, but these often require more guidance in the verification process. So we've been trying to use SMP solvers for this. The interesting thing is if you accept that you can verify everything, you can easily automatically, without any intervention, sort of get 80 to 90 percent of your template code to verified with these assumptions being made explicit. What does that mean? It means that testing is now cut down to a tenth of the original cost. So for a few seconds of SMT solvers, you get rid of 90% of your testing. And as I mentioned briefly in the beginning, if you use very fine grained typing, your type system actually also gets rid of lots of possibilities for errors. But you have to use sort of very, very fine grained typing, much finer than you would think. But it's sort of an interesting approach and also with this required API, you can be as fine grained as you want. You can separate distance, length, height, speed, time into different types. And that eliminates several classes of problems from your generic code. And then you just instantiate it with real and addition anyway. So the computation aspect is the same. So it's a slight overhead on your source code, but you get rid of errors and you get rid of testing time. And thus also you get rid of debug time. So it is really a good money saver by trying to do, use these tools systematically. And just do the easy stuff. Let the tools do the easy stuff. You can then focus your brain power on the difficult stuff. Ah, this is also, oh. Are we getting to where we want to get? Because I can use those property-based equations to rewrite my code. We started out with the AOS SLA transformation, but here we're sort of looking at more semantic-based transformations. So let me say that I have an assert E1 is equal to E2, by the commutativity A plus B is B plus A, or associativity as we looked at before, we have some very simple property. Or we have that zero times x is equal to x. So we use that to say that if I can find a sub-expression in my code, and I can match that sub-expression with the left side expression here, for instance. So M is some matching technology. There's bunches of this already in existence, so don't worry too much. Basically saying that this is an expression with three variables and I match my three variables to sub-expressions of E, and I can find a match that matches my expression on the left, like this. Then I do the same substitution, the same match transformation on E2. And then I've transformed E with, which was M of E1 with M of E2. 
And that's a different program text, but if the property holds, it has the same semantics. For example, I have this assert that zero times x equals zero on my element type. Then I have a matrix type. And of the matrix type, I may have something saying that zero matrix plus matrix is equal to the matrix. That's a mistake. So I have these two properties, and then I have a fragment of my code where I've shown that I have a scalar which happens to be zero at this point of the computation. And that zero is scalared into a matrix C, which is multiplied by a matrix D. And then I add the matrix B. Now by repeatedly applying this, I can sort of show that oh, this has to be the zero matrix, and the zero matrix times D is also the zero matrix. So I can then reduce this to the zero matrix and voila, and then know that I can get rid of this term altogether and just concentrate on the term. So now I can reduce this code, which was doing quite a lot of matrix computations, to this code, which is just doing an assignment. And maybe I can use further analysis to get rid of the intermediate variable A and just use the variable B. So there's sort of possibility now of using your semantic properties to modify your source code to achieve increased efficiency. And like we had in the AUS SLA example, we want to have this in a tool chain and not having this in the way I have to write my source code. I want to have tools which can manipulate my source code to give me a more efficient source code. At the low level, compilers are extremely good at this today, but they cannot do this at the matrix level. However, you switch on your optimizations in the compiler, it will not be able to eliminate this. This is based on knowledge of the domain and properties of the domain operations. So we're talking about the different levels of source code. But we just talked about trying to lift the level of your source code, the way you're thinking about it, to more abstract types, more abstract operations. And at that level, these claims make sense. And at that level, you can use them to well, in this setting, we have the requirements for the templates. We have the template body, and you can use this to modify the template body according to the properties we know we have for the expected arguments. Or we may be using the template in different settings, but when we use it in a setting where we know these things, these we you know these things, these rewrites are valid. If you're using it in a setting where these things are not known, then you cannot do the rewrite. But since we offered this to a tool, we're not messing up our program. We're trying to keep our program as readable as possible, or the tool sort of extracts the hidden information that's there. Yeah, uh, we also have this example from yesterday in a slightly more compact version, which leads up to the big assignment for today or this morning. So should we do this before the break or should we have a break now and then we do the assignment and then we get to chatter? I think we do the break now and then I 